we're, we're talking about, we're going to talk about the fuel tonight. Fuel AX5. Yeah. That's like, that's a bike like we always try to get everybody. If somebody wants to start mountain biking, that's a bike we try to get them on. Mm -hmm. I bought that bike before for new riders that I wanted to kind of have an advantage. Um, so yeah. the fuel AX5, do we have a yellow one? Uh, we do. We have an extra small marigold one. Okay. We can look at the dark one, I guess. We'll bring the other color out too. Which is your favorite color? I'm kind of a fan of this one. It's kind of got a little purple going on in it. Uh, you could get some cool accent colors. It's a little more low key than the marigold. And my personal favorite, they match the RockShox decals to the paint down here. We're on the marigold one. They don't. So you got a little extra bit of customization right there on the fork lower. The marigold one, what color is it? Just gray or something? Yep. I think we're ready nice. to do this. What do you think? Awesome. All right, yeah, so the Fuel X5, why why do you recommend it to people? It's Trex real all-rounder bike. If you're only allowed to have one bike, this is really the bike that'll do it all. It uh, is capable of tackling some gnarly trails, but it'll also you can pedal it back up to the top super easily. It's by far going to be their most efficient pedaling full suspension trail bike. Um, this new model, it's a little longer. It's a little slacker. Uh, Pretty much just going in line with how other manufacturers are treating it, making it a little more enduro friendly, but it's still not a full blown enduro bike. It'll really be able to uh, pedal around. You could even race it in cross country or Nike races. Uh, it's still super pedalable for that. Part of what makes it super pedalable is the straight shot down tube. Yeah, that's it's going to be cool. super stiff. It's super stiff. The whole bike revolves around it, um, and it's a be able to work with that straight shot down tube, it created a couple issues. So first of all, when the bars turn, let's, the crown on, could impact. On. Let's back up because that's a really important part. And that's why we recommend this bike to everybody. So, it, you know, right now, 2022 model or 2021, whatever you want to call it, it we're sitting right at about 2,500 bucks for this bike, full suspension bikes. It, the cheapest full suspension bike that's going to be able to even survive on a trail is going to cost you two thousand dollars. I don't care mm -hmm. who it's from, and it, it doesn't is. come with a dropper for that price. Most point. likely so. not, yeah, because like we have the Marin Riftstone, it's eighteen eighty nine. I'm sure there's other brands out there that have their uh, uh, kind of sub two thousand dollar rig. But the cool thing with track, uh, uh, you're going to pay a little bit more, but it's a little bit nicer build. A, um, you know, you have some cooler features, but you're getting. The same technology that they put on their $8,000 bikes, their $9,000 bikes, you're getting that same technology. And Trek, like if you think about, uh, there's companies that do a lot of R&D in order mm -hmm. to put their frames and their bikes together. Trek specialized are probably the two biggest. Mm -hmm. And I can guarantee you Trek's R&D department is 20 times bigger than specialized. Mm -hmm. And what you get for that is things like the straight down tubes that they say something like 30% extra stiffness. Um, as far as the frame goes, it's super noticeable. Like I don't, whenever I ride a bike with a straight down tube, um, climbing just seems super easy. I just see the bike seems to really want to charge forward all the time. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that is, but yeah, like you were saying, oh, and then that, so you, it comes all the way from that front triangle by the headset. So you got that straight down tube. Normally you would see, Point, point right there at the down tube. Is there another bike that's nearby? Okay, so if you look at like, that's a straight down tube there compared to like a slash here. The slash does not have the straight down tube. So you can see it kind of angles a little bit. All right, sorry. Weird camera stuff. And that probably just lagged everything out. So it's airplane. <laughs> um, but yeah, that straight down tube, that's really what they built the bike around. It's going to make it super stiff, super easy to pedal, super efficient to pedal. Um, but when they did do that, they kind of created some issues. Basically, the fork crown just doesn't, it won't clear. If you crash, it'll smash into there. So they created knock block. It's a steering limit that is built into your headset, your spacers, and your stem that just limits the, how far your bars and your fork can go. So if you crash, your bars aren't going to spin around and hit your top tube. Uh, could easily put some nasty dents in there. Or if you have a carbon bike, so uh, it would just. And not how knock clock works essentially is it's got at the the top of the head tube, 
Um, so pointed at the top of the head to where the knock block insert is. So there, um, there's a, it's kind of shaped out or shaved out and they have an aluminum insert that goes in there. It's a series of notches. So each one of the spacers have a notch that fits in this slot on the top there. So it slides back and forth in there. Um, and every single spacer has that and the stem has it. So they all kind of connect like Legos almost or like, um, uh, Lincoln logs. Did mm-hmm. you play with Lincoln yep. logs? Yep. Yeah. At the doctor's all... office. That's where I always played with Lincoln logs. Nice. I don't remember Lincoln logs anywhere else, but anyhow. Um, so they go like that. So one thing that I see come up a lot in like fuel forums or truck forums, um, people talk about there's like an extra little bit of slop. It would be interesting to see. So you won't notice it on all of them really bad, but when you turn these bars all the way, They'll go to a point and then they go a little bit further. So this is where it just wants to stop and then it goes a little further. Sometimes people worry about that because they think that something's messed up mm-hmm. in there. I've had customers bring bikes back in for that. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, I see it asked in the forums all the time. So they're like, yeah, my knock block catches and then it goes again. like a, it, And that's like a full like quarter inch. Like mm-hmm. It's pretty significant. And what that is, is that's just all the slop from those six different spacers and that stem, mm-hmm. that's everything kind of doing that. So it's mm-hmm. completely normal. They do that very specifically. If everything was perfectly machined in there mm-hmm. and everything was down to the, you know, the hundredth of a thousandth mm-hmm. of an inch or whatever, um, then that would bind up and it would not work properly. Mm-hmm. So they actually do leave that little bit extra slop. And sometimes on some bikes, you'll notice it a little bit more than others. That's not an issue. I mean, always make sure your headset's mm-hmm. properly adjusted. Um, but yeah, that's the important thing with the knock block. You know, I, and and I think, you know, it, it, I never found it on any bike I rode with knock block to like disable me from being able to go, you know, to a, through a switchback or something like that. And here in St. Louis, you know, our trails are pretty old and cross country and equestrian and such mm-hmm. in nature. So, I mean, now we have all the newer, newer stuff coming in with, with bank turns and berms and things along those lines. But we have a lot of tight switchbacks and stuff. You're never going to overdo that. I mean, you're going to be crossing your, your handlebars and over the frame if you go any further. So, I mean, it's not really an issue as far as ride goes at all. Maybe when you crash would be a time when you would mm-hmm. see an issue with that. Um, but it just it's protecting your frame and your cables. I mean, it's pretty common on a bike like this. If you crash and your bar spin around, it's going to actually rip your cables out of the frame. So you could be out in the middle of the woods, have your shift cable, dropper cable, brake cables or brake lines or whatever. Just pulled out of your frame and you just won't be able to use that for the rest of the ride. You at all. That's no I fun. I forgot I did that. So another cool thing that Bond Trigger makes is if you don't want to use Bond Trigger's stem and spacers, they do make an adapter that you can throw on. It's about 30 bucks. You just throw it on right there and you can use non knock block stems as well. So it's very compatible with all aftermarket brands. You don't have to use the Bond Trigger stem if you want to switch things up and size or style, get some cool colors going on there as well. Did you have that down low for a reason? I did not okay. know. I just didn't want everybody to feel like they were just a bunch of kids mm-hmm. listening to us the whole time. For sure. This camera's kind of looking at me eye to eye, but yours was kind of a little too low. You. you looked really big. It looked pretty, pretty awesome. Um, but yeah, so knock block is what it is. But yeah, you brought that up last week to me, and I hadn't really ever considered that. But mm-hmm. knock block is also there to save your cables mm-hmm. from getting ripped out, especially like a brake cable or something, which would suck on a ride. So really cool. Um, so yeah, and then once you move past the knock block, just kind of sticking on the frame is APB. I know we've talked about this in other videos, um, but it's my favorite bit of bike tech. Um, really cool design, and it's really a design kind of how the, the 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 pivots sit in line with the bottom of the rear triangle, or what so is basically it? the seat stay here is supposed to be a full floater design. So all the braking forces in the brake, which is on the seats say are really going to be isolated from how the suspension works. So if you're going through some rough terrain, you're heavy on the brakes, instead of the suspension impacting your suspension and packing it down, it's going to allow the suspension to compress and decompress and rebound. Totally normal. It's not going to interfere with it at all. Uh, other bike brands haven't quite gotten that figured out yet. So when you're bombing through some chunky stuff, the fuel is really going to show with that high-end technology from Trek. 
And yeah, then really cool. Cam McCall's got a video uh, mm -hmm. here on YouTube that people can go watch by truck. Truck has a lot of really cool tech videos mm -hmm. from, you know, whether it's Cam, uh, whether it's Gary Fisher um, or some other pro riders in the industry, they all put together some really cool tech videos that are, are worthwhile to watch if you're considering buying it. And it's not going to be over your head at all either. No, Gary Fisher and Cam McCall are pretty, uh, they're pretty out there guys and they really dumb it down for everyone. So even I can understand it. It's, it's interesting. Pretty good I was thinking about that this morning mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, what we're doing like on our live streams is very similar to kind of mm -hmm. how Trek rolls with their stuff. They have obviously much better they have production Cam McCall. plan yeah. going, but yeah, and, and like, yeah, more attractive people that have that know a lot more than us. Um, but yeah, I, I think they do talk in a similar way. And I think that's important. Like I, I, anybody can go and read the specs on these mm -hmm. bikes. I think we all know, anybody watching this video knows it has 140 mil of travel. They know that it's an X-Fusion on the rear. <laughs> um, they know all this different stuff. So we'll kind of get into that a little bit. Um, so yeah, APB, truck doesn't make big enough deal out of, go watch a video on it. You'll see why it's cool. They aren't kidding. Your rear wheel, rear wheel will track the ground super well. And the more your your wheel stays in contact with the ground, the more of your energy that you're using spinning the pedals and therefore spinning the wheel is going to be propelling you forward instead of that wheel being off the ground. Um, and it, it makes is, you faster. It is going to make you faster. All right. So um, if we're kind of sticking around in the back on the drivetrain, we got full Shimano drivetrain cranks, cassette. Um, is that a 12 speed this year? It is. It is a 12 speed Dior. It's always cool. We're going to have that wide range on there. And it does come with a hyperglide cassette and matching hyperglide chain. It's going to make it shift super smooth. Right. So uh, that, that's something to watch out for when you are buying bikes. Um, pay very close attention to what brand the cassette is mm -hmm. and what brand the chain is. Yep. Because a lot of manufacturers will cut corners there. A truck does not do that. That's why you're paying 2400 bucks mm -hmm. for this bike. Where you might find something that seems like it has similar specs for maybe two twenty two hundred mm -hmm. or two grand or something. Yeah. Um, it's it's those little things that you don't realize when you're looking at a bike that are going to make all the world a difference in shifting and things like that. Mm -hmm. And the other reason, and this is why I always try to push people to the Fuel X five. It's upgradable, so mm -hmm. you've got that twelve speed Dior setup. Your hub is going to have a micro spline. So that means that you can upgrade to XT mm -hmm. um, as your budget allows. You can put an XT cassette on there. You can put an XT derailleur on, get an XT shifter, and then you can shift under load. You're going to have something super reliable, super crispy. I love XT shifters because mm -hmm. they have that like just super positive feel. Mm -hmm. like, you know when you're shifting. Exactly. Going back to the rear hub uh, with the cassette, this is a Dior cassette. There's nothing wrong with it. But when you get to the higher end cassettes, some of the parts in here that are steel on the Dior one are going to be aluminum. So it's going to be lighter weight, less rotating mass, less unsprung weight, which is really noticeable and important on a bike. Then further into the hub in the free hub. Wait, this... the Dior cassette, just like if you have a Dior cassette in your hand and you have a Shimano cassette in your hand, I'm not going to go look up the grams and numbers on it. It's considerably heavier. Like yep. it's crazy how heavy a Dior cassette mm -hmm. is compared to an XT cassette mm -hmm. and the price is about three times as much. It, the price is very indicative of how much better it is. Um, and then on this bike, the Fuel X5, it does not have a rapid drive hub, but on the eight and up models, it will have a rapid drive hub. So it's set up with 54 points of engagement with three poles and three springs. However, there are spots for six poles and six springs. So if you want, you can order the parts from Trek or Bontrager or even your local bike shop may have them in stock. Just add three extra poles in there and you'll double your points of engagement to a, a 108 rapid, rapid drive. Yeah. Yep. So on not, a rapid not drive. Not on up. this bike. Not yep. the Fuel X5. The Fuel X8 and up will have that. Step up the eight. Or if you have a five, if you go to your local Trek dealer or have the bike in for service and want to look into upgrading your wheel, a rear wheel upgrade is huge on a bike, probably the mm -hmm. biggest performance one of the biggest performance upgrades you can do um, is a nice rear wheel. You could get a 54 tooth rapid drive hub, you know, wheel hub from a wheel from track. I forget the price on them, but they're not too crazily priced. And then for another 30 bucks, add those springs. Mm -hmm. and it, it basically sounds somebody like a some high end hub. Yeah. Somebody bought some online and I think they're, they maybe showed up this store today. 
tomorrow maybe we'll i think on. my roommate was actually the one that ordered that oh cool so yeah, I did that in my hub. He heard the sound and was like, "Whoa, nice! That sounds pretty cool. I guess I got to do that now." Uh, so he was pretty jealous that my stock hubs with a thirty dollar upgrade sounded nearly identical to a seven hundred dollar profile hubs. So it's a pretty cool, pretty cool system that they got going on there. And just to breeze through some parts, it has a dropper post. Um, is that just like a Bond Trugger brand dropper mm -hmm. on it? I believe so. Yep, so, nothing special, but it certainly gets the job done. It does. How's it going, man? The rear shocks and extrusion. What do they call that? Like the Pro or something? I'm not exactly sure. Um, it's a pretty solid entry level uh, shock. Comes stock on a lot of entry level bikes. However, on the nicer models, they'll come with uh, a three shaft technology or even a reactive three shaft technology. Um, the nice thing about this shock, though, most of your bikes at two grand full suspension bikes aren't going to have any type of lockout or anything on there. Mm -hmm. um, so you do have the lockout there. I don't ever recommend using lockouts on your bike. The only time I really feel like you, I mean, you know, maybe if you're racing, whatever else. And, you know, I have no idea what people need to be doing there. I'm not recommending for that. But as far as normal trail riding goes, um, you should leave everything open. You should basically set that stuff up for your weight, set it up for your riding style, and then that's all you need to do. Make sure it's got the right amount of air. Mm -hmm. and sit there, and uh, if you you want your suspension working when you're climbing, you want your rear suspension working, you want your front suspension working because it's going to absorb all the bumps on the trail and it's going to make sure rear wheel stays grounded. If you lock out your rear suspension to make it easier for you to climb, then your rear wheel is going to bounce up off the ground. It's going to lose traction and then you're going to lose traction. You're not mm -hmm. going to be able to climb. So um, will the bike be more efficient if it was locked out? Technically, mm -hmm. but if you're, I know here in St. Louis, we have super rudy rocky trails. So you want it open so that the wheels tracking, mm -hmm. you know, over those, those bumps and everything like that. Um, you know, if you're on like a long gravel climb or a street climb mm -hmm. or something, you have a transition period. Um, or I know like out west or in other places, they walk, ride fire roads and stuff a lot. So you would definitely want to lock it out for them. So it's really good for those people. But it's nice to have that option um, to lock that stuff out. Definitely um, don't want to hop off a curb or anything with it locked out. That would not be fun for you or the shock. Um, so on the higher end models, it'll come with a reactive shock. Uh, so it's going to be Rock Shocks exclusive uh, reactive technology. So basically it senses when you're pedaling and it kind of stiffens it up a little bit. And then when it hit, senses that your rear wheel hits a big rock, it instantly softens up. So you'll have that nice compliance for when you hit stuff, but it's gonna make it a little stiffer for just normal pedaling up hills. Gonna get a little more efficiency, but as he was saying, if you do hit a rock on a climb, it'll soften up and keep that rear wheel tracking on the ground. That's going to be on their higher end models like the eight and above. Cool. So, again, another thing that's not on this bike. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. And then truck goes through a lot. It, you know, kind of we talked about their R&D department earlier. They go through a lot um, as far as the technology that goes into tuning those suspensions. They worked with Formula One race team. Mm -hmm. What's the name of them? Penske. Pens Penske. Mm -hmm. I'm not a Formula One guy which I know is offensive because there's <laughs> guys who are super into it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they worked with the Penske race team to, to make sure that got dialed in. So pretty cool stuff with that. Um, what kind of brakes is bike run? It's just going to come with a stock uh, kind of the banana lever is what the slang term is for these. Just the stock basic Shimano brakes, so two that's... pistons. So I say that they're just stock brakes, but they're really good stock brakes. They're hydraulic super nice right 180 mil rotor on the front one 180 on the rear uh 180 front rear yep so 180 front rear shimano redesigned or kind of went through a redesign i guess 2020 and then 2020 into 2021 um and they're kind of lower level the mt 200 or whatever the level that comes the entry level shimano hydraulic brake um, they a redesigned the actual body of it. Mm -hmm. Um, so it kind of looks like what the SLX is and mm -hmm. XTs looked like back in the day. Um, but they did put a new lever on it. Mm -hmm. So Shimano's kind of low end lever used to be this like really straight long thing. Mm -hmm. And now it is set up a little bit better mm -hmm. for, for one finger braking and stuff like that. So that is cool. The, the brake lever is a little bit nicer than it used to be. 
they're super solid. I mean, yep. I that, run them on my Elroy. Yeah, it has the same lever. It has a four fist and caliper, but the lever up here is going to be the exact same. Yeah, really nice feel. And you, then reliable. You can adjust them right there as well, so it's not going to have the external adjustment like the high end XT ones are. But you could still get that same adjustment just right there. Cool. So we went over basically everything on the bike. We kind of um, went through the brakes, Shimano brakes, just two piston brakes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's good enough for trails around here. Yeah. Uh, but if you're going to Shepherd, like some legit downhill gravity trails, you would probably at least want to upgrade to a 203 up front. So if you're uh, some out, four piston, yeah. If you're out out in Western United mm -hmm. States, or if you're just somewhere, if you're riding bike park, you're gonna need to put a bigger rotor on. Yep. About halfway down the run, you'll just your front brake's just not gonna be there. It'll work about two thirds of what it used to, and that's kind of terrifying. Now, and that's got a, an adapter on it to fit mm -hmm. that fork, right? So yep. in order to put a two hundred three adapter on that. Um, You'd have to fork. buy. You'd have to buy an adapter. Yeah, you have to get a new adapter and a new rotor. And the adapter is like a really weird squared look off looking mm -hmm. Shimano adapter. We have some. Uh, I think they may be in back. Are they in back? Yeah, it's like a, a two hundred three. It's not going to look like what's on here. No, it doesn't it's... look like a standard kind of one. It it. It offsets everything a little mm -hmm. bit too in order to make everything fit. So yeah, it, putting a bigger rotor on is not a big deal. That's you know forty bucks or whatever for a bigger rotor. And then um, is that center lock? It's six bolt. Six bolt, nice. So um, yeah, easy to find a rotor. The adapter might be a little harder to find. I think we have one in shop. Mm -hmm. So if you're seeing this video sometime soon, it's still COVID times. Um, maybe we still have that one. Um, we haven't had a lot of people upgrading rotors lately. I feel like last last winter, like that's all we were doing. Everybody mm -hmm. wanted to upgrade their, mm -hmm. their rotors bigger because I guess they were preparing mm -hmm. for some of the bigger stuff coming yep. out. Everyone's already done that. Yep. Um, so that's the best way to before you go worrying about having to upgrade and spend four or five hundred dollars on an awesome set of hope brakes or some other crazy set of brakes that you want. Um, first step, get bigger, get a bigger rotor up front. Um, put a 203 on the front and then if you're still not feeling the power if you're still overheating things um, then maybe look into doing like a, a shimano mt 520 or whatever their four mm -hmm. piston kind of yep. dior level um and those can be had for i don't know you know 125 to 150 bucks so um yeah so brakes fork last thing suspension um it's got a recon on the front 140 mil right Yep, 140 up front with a debonair air spring. It's going to make it super progressive. And it also has a chart right on the side of here that allows you to dial in your preload. You don't really even have to use this adjuster or you get out a ruler. It just, you go to where your fork is set. So 140, and they'll show you the percentages from 20 to 30%. Uh, depending on your writing style, you can change out how much sag you'll have. Um, and that's really going to affect the angle your bike is and how the geometry of your bike is going to work. So you can really fine tune the way your bike feels with preload. Um, and then can we jack this up a little bit here? So the other thing, a lot of, you know, I assume if you're watching this, by, this video for information about a Teeley X5, you're probably a newer rider. Make sure that you get your suspension adjusted correctly. There's a guide on the inside of the fork to tell you what the air pressure is. And if you're buying a fuel, you can go on Truck's website. There's a suspension calculator. It will ask you your personal details and it will tell you how many clicks to turn this adjuster on the bottom. Um, that's gonna be your, your uh, rebound adjustment. It's gonna control how fast one set suspension compresses, how fast it returns. They did a bunch of science and math. They paid people a lot of money to figure that out. So go on their website, super easy to find. It's like, go to the page for the fuel. Um, and at the bottom, you'll see suspension calculator. Do that, get your bike set up right. Um, if you're gonna ride a full suspension bike, you do have to pay attention to it. Um, especially if you're coming from a hardtail, there's gonna be a lot of things to start thinking about. Um, you know, the, and this is all gonna be dependent on where you live. 
Um, but the, the fork's going to hold its air pretty well. Once you put air in there, you're kind of good to mm -hmm. go. Get big elevation changes, temperature changes, things like that could affect the, the air. It's a fairly large chamber, and it's typically only going to be around 100 PSI or so, so it's not under mm -hmm. super high pressure. When we start talking about the rear shock, though, it's a very small chamber of air, and it's under very high pressure. We're typically going to be talking about pressures from 170 to 230 PSI, depending on the rider's weight. So with your rear shock, you need to be checking that. I mean, at least every, I would say every two weeks, like really every ride, if your shock loses, like let's say you have 180 PSI in there, you lose 10 PSI, 20 PSI doesn't seem like that much. But if your bike sitting, if you go from, I like my bike to be a little bit deeper in its sag, so I'll tend to sit, you know, 25 to 30%. Um, I like to be a little bit deeper in to begin with. So if I lose 10%, I might, I might be sagging down to like, you know, or I may get into that, mm -hmm. that stroke 35% or so, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to be bottoming out. I'm going to be, you know, hitting my pedals. Mm -hmm. Things just aren't going to go well for me if I'm only talking about a 10 to 10 PSI difference. So, or if check you, that a lot. or if you hit a jump or a feature expecting your bike to react a certain way because right. you think it has a certain pressure in it and you go off the feature and the shock rebounds either too quick or too slow because it has too much or too low pressure, the bike's going to do something you don't want it to do and aren't expecting. So that's really just not a good time. Um, no. So yeah, that's a fuel X five. I think that's a, a cool rundown. So that's what I've bought in my family um, has been the fuel X five. When I looked around at all the bikes that were optioned to me, um, the fuel X five was the bike that made the most sense. Um, I, I was buying it in a small frame. I went ahead with 29 inch tires mm -hmm. because the chain stay stays the same, yep. um, whether it's a 29 or 27 five. Um, so, so I bought the 29er so that the rider was able to kind of get over things a little bit easier, get a dropper post, stuff like that. That 29, 27 and a half option is only available in the size small. Trek did some research and they found out that riders in the small size are pretty split, fairly even down the middle, whether they wanted 27 or 29. So they made both options. For medium, large, extra large, and double XL, they only have 29er available. And for extra small, they only have 27 and a half available. So size small is the only size where you get to pick your wheel size. And we've got plenty of fuel ex 5s If someone is looking for one, we are in St. Louis, Missouri. If you want it, you do have to come. You can buy it online. You have to pick it up in store. But then you have to show up here to pick it up. We will not send it to you. Um, we got a bunch of cool trails here. We got a downhill bike park right down yeah. there. We have some world-class enduro trails with some new jump lines and flow trails right down the street 10 15 minutes away we're right here in st louis in eureka yeah. so we can really uh yeah you eureka. can come here camp hit some trails yeah it's a nice little staycation yeah and it's there's a lot of cool stuff to do around here and then the next old town over is pacific and that's a cool town mm -hmm. um but yeah that's it come visit us in st louis buy a bike don't buy a bike get a free sticker. If you visit us from somewhere else, we will give you a free sticker and we will tattoo you if you would like mom bike shed tattoo for free. It's not a real tattoo, just a little it's temporary press on tattoo. Well, we could get it's real for as long as it's there though.